Good morning. Man, it's already been a pretty awesome day, right? And we got to celebrate a couple of baptisms together. Uh, that, like, I'm good. Uh, like, my day is awesome now, no matter what. So, um, it's my favorite thing. One of my other favorite things um, is that we get to dive into Scripture together today. Uh, we're starting this new series called Build Your Church. Where we're going to take a look at the book of Acts together. I'm very excited about this. Uh, Often when we study a book, uh, we're not able to cover every single verse through that series. And so I want to encourage you guys, during this time, read the book of Acts, okay? And there's options about how you can do that. There's all kinds of plans out there. If you're like, hey, I just want to open my Bible and read the book of Acts, like that's awesome. I think having a plan is good because it keeps you on pace and things, but... Um, I am going to read Acts through this plan. It's actually the second part of a plan we did when we read the book of Luke together as a church. And so if you want to hop in that with me, um, you can scan this code or go to crosspointcape.com slash Acts, and you can hop in that, that Bible reading plan with me, and we can read together. I think that would be really cool, so I invite you to do that. I think 148 people uh, read the Luke plan with us, and um, that was a, a really cool experience to be able to hear some of your thoughts about what we were reading together. And so uh, I can't wait to study this book together, so uh, we're just going to dive in, okay? You guys ready? Chapter 1, verse 1, let's roll, all right? In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Man, this is uh, really just our introduction to this book, okay? Okay. And so he, he recaps some of the things he talked about in Luke. Acts is part two of Luke's work, okay? So we have part one, which is the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, which we looked at in The Man and the Mission, and now we're on to part two. I know some of you guys were not here for The Man and the Mission series uh, a couple months ago, and so if you weren't a part of that, I want to encourage you um, this week, before we get too far into Acts, Read Luke, like the book, which I know sounds really daunting and intimidating. I get that. Like, Matt, can't you give, give me like four key verses or something? Um, here's the thing. It's not actually that intimidating. It's not that daunting. The book of Luke can be read uh, by most people in about an hour and 40 minutes. So what that means is if this afternoon you take 15 minutes and read the book of Luke, and you do that every day, then when you get here next Sunday, you will have read the book of Luke in 15 minutes a day, okay? So I'm, this isn't like six hours of reading a day I'm assigning you. I mean, I'm not assigning it anyway, but like I'm encouraging, right? Like, I don't know, got nervous. Um, <laughs> teachers uh, stress me out sometimes. So it's not an assignment, okay? There's no homework here. Well, kind of. Um, so I just would encourage you to do that. Uh, Luke really intended this as part two. So uh, we're heading into the second movie in a series, right? And so uh, you want to watch the first movie first to know what we're talking about. Um, and so this is, this is something you can do in less time than it would take you to watch a movie, okay? Uh, man, the other thing that I really want to highlight here in this introduction I think is incredibly powerful. You can put this up for me. Thank you. Look at these words. I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. What he began to do in this segment of time, until he was taken up to heaven. Um, there is like a Greek term used here that we don't have an English translation for. Kind of our closest phrase would be to say, on one hand, 
And then you expect sometime later, I would say, on the other hand, right? Like on one hand, this, on the other hand, that. And what Luke writes here is, on one hand, Jesus began his ministry. On one hand, all of these things that have happened, from the birth of Jesus all the way through the resurrection and the ascension, on one hand. On the other hand, acts. On the other hand, this entire book. On the other hand, what I'm about to tell you. And so Luke is not so subtly telling us here, this entire book, the book of Acts, all of this history of the early church, all of Jesus building his church, it is the continued work, the continued ministry of Jesus through the Holy Spirit and through his church, through the body of Christ. And that's important for us because that means that, that this, this whole book is about our history. It's about who we are as followers of Jesus. And Luke continues to kind of weave this together through this book really, really intentionally. Um, at some point in my life over the last, I don't know how many years, I became kind of like a a Bible literary nerd. I like love some of this literary stuff that takes place in scripture, okay? Um, and so you're gonna have to hang with me for just a second because I think this is really cool, all right? Luke does something incredibly intentional in the book of Acts where he writes some scenes that we'll read to, to mirror, to make us think of, to reflect things that were similar that happened in the life of Jesus, and it's really intentional because he's trying to draw our focus back to Jesus and help us remember all of these things that are continuing to happen are, are the continuation of the ministry of Jesus. And so when we read stories about people standing trial in the book of Acts, there are phrases and terms used that were intentionally used to draw us back to the trial of Jesus. Luke is telling us, hey, the story of Jesus, it's our story. The mission of Jesus, it's our mission. We as followers of Jesus are continuing his work. We're continuing his story. N.T. Wright is an incredible author, and he talks about that concept of this literary stuff. And so I want to make sure I remember to give him credit there. Um, I, I also uh, was really impacted by this quote this week from Tim Mackey talking about this. Uh, when Jesus followers are faithfully representing him in the world, their stories will look like his. Because when we are faithfully representing Jesus to this world, our stories will look like his. We're going to be continuing out the ministry of Jesus. We will be his hands and his feet, his body, the church. And in some ways, there are moments of that that are awesome and exciting. There were some real mountaintop moments in the ministry of Jesus. But there's also a reality for us as followers of Jesus that persecution wrongful conviction, and even death followed the ministry of Jesus. The world wasn't thrilled with Jesus. And so sometimes for us as followers of Jesus, as we faithfully represent him, life will be hard. Our lives will look like his life. The work and story of Jesus are continued through you. And that's, that's the message of this introduction to the book of Acts. That the, the work and story of Jesus are continued through you if you're one of his followers. Jesus wants to continue to change the world through you to change hearts, to change lives, to change eternities through you. That is an incredibly powerful truth for us. 
I am going to keep moving because we don't have 33 hours for me to preach to you guys. Um, I know. I'm sorry, too. Um, <laughs> verse 6. Well, when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and, and they're not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him as they, they strained to, to see him rising into heaven. Two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Has the time come? Has the time come for you to free Israel? Has the time come for this to happen? And he says, look, that, that, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what you need to be focused on right now, okay? But I do have something for you to focus on. I do have a very clear mission for you. I need you guys to go and, and, and tell people about me. Um, go back in Jerusalem, tell them. Um, really go to all of Judea. And here's what's interesting, guys. I believe that if this was just some Jewish boys making up this story, this is where Jesus would stop talking, all right? That they would be like, yeah, and then Jesus told us that we're supposed to tell everybody in Jerusalem and everyone in all of Judea about him, all the Jews. But he keeps talking and he, he says Samaria, where the Samaritans live. The Jews did not like the Samaritans at all. And if you're trying to start a movement from a human perspective, being like, hey, so we gotta, we gotta go to our enemies and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna share God with them, was not the move. That was not the strategic move here. But Jesus isn't working from our human perspective. He, he, his thoughts are higher, his ways are greater. He knows more And so he says to them, hey, this isn't just for you guys. This is for everyone. So yeah, I want you to spread the news of who I am in Jerusalem. And, and yeah, I want you to spread it all throughout all of Judea. But then I want you to keep going to Samaria, to the people you don't like very much, to the people who don't talk like you or look like you or worship like you. And I want you to tell them about me. And then I want you to keep going to the very ends of the earth. I want you to keep going, to tell everyone about me. This is your mission. And then Jesus ascends to heaven, which I grew up in church. So I've been hearing this thing my entire life. And, and this week as I was preparing for this sermon, I, I just, working through it line by line, was kind of like, you know, I don't think I give enough credit for how weird that would have been, okay? Um, I mean, they had seen Jesus do a lot of things by this point. They'd seen him walk on water. They'd been in rooms with him where he just like disappeared, right? Like they've seen things. He multiplied food. He's healed people. He's brought people back from the dead. He himself came back from the dead. They've seen things, but I still think when he started to ascend, like at minimum, they had to be like, well, that's new, right? <laughs> Like, even their calmest response had to be like, huh. And so their friend starts to ascend to heaven, and they respond to, like, they're just watching. They're like, this is crazy, right? And they're watching as, as long as they can, and, and he disappears into some clouds, and they're straining. They're trying, to, they're trying to see him. I mean, I try to see it when a rocket ship is launched into space. I think if one of my friends was just ascending up into heaven, I'd be more locked in, you know? And these guys are, I imagine, very locked in. They're like, what's going to happen? Like, he's just going, like, where does it stop? And they're trying to find him because he disappeared, right? Do you think any of them were like, I see, oh, it's a bird. It's not him. <laughs> right? 
these are the things I wonder about, okay? And, and so they're watching this all occur. They're straining. And all of a sudden, two men, just men in white robes, messengers from God, show up. Like, men of Galilee, what are you doing? He gave you your orders. He gave you your instructions. Like, you know what's next. You know what the mission is. Like, he's gone. He's, he's out of here. Like, you're not going to find him, all right? I imagine there was a little bit of, like, don't blind yourself staring at the sun. They were probably, like, straining themselves like I did when there was the eclipse thing. I'm one of those people who went out there without my safety glasses and was like, and I can still see all of you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he was concerned. Guys, you got that, like, you got what's next. You were told what to do, to go back to Jerusalem and wait. And so these guys do, they, they obey, they, they go back to Jerusalem and, and they wait, and they wait, and days are passing, and at some point they decide in their free time, you know, there were 12 of us. Like, Jesus picked 12, 12 is like a big number, 12 tribes, there should be 12 of us, Right? And there were 12, and now there's 11 because Judas is gone. And so let's, we got to nominate a new 12th guy to the team. And so um, they, they do have some qualifications for this. There's some order at part of this. Um, they decide that it should be someone who was with them from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, uh, when he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan, all, all the way through the resurrection. And so they have multiple people who are candidates for this, which tells us, guys, there, there were people who followed Jesus for his entire ministry. Three years from town to town who, who are not listed as apostles. But they, they narrow it down to kind of the final two options and then, then they cast lots to let God decide. And Matthias is who is chosen to be the new 12th guy. And so there are 12 apostles again, and, and then they kind of go back to waiting, all right? We're going to pick that up in chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. I love this because there could have been an actual windstorm, and there may have been, okay? But that's not what we read here, that's not what's in the Greek. There was just the sound of a mighty windstorm, which in some ways, guys, would have been so much more scary, right? You like hear rushing wind and then you like go outside and there's no wind, just the sound of wind. Sorry, um, it would have weirded me out. Uh, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages. As the Holy Spirit gave them this ability, at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they had heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. We're Parthians and Medes and Elamites and people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and then the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Christians and Arabs, and we all we're all hearing these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things that God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What, what can this mean? They asked each other. So in, in this time, uh, Jerusalem would have been absolutely slammed with people, okay? Okay. Um, about three times a year during Passover, Pentecost, and the, the festival of booths, these three religious festivals, 
the city of Jerusalem would grow in size because people from all over would travel there to celebrate this. Um, Historians believe that it would be more than 300 times its normal size, okay? That's hard for us to even imagine, all right? Because we all know the difference in Cape Coral between June and January, okay? Like, we know how that feels. And our population grows by, like, 20%. 300 times. I know your 15-minute drive to work became 42 minutes, but this is a whole nother level. (laughs) Like, there are people from all over the world there, and the Holy Spirit shows up, and these guys start, they're, they're, they're praising God, they're celebrating, they're talking about the things that God has done, and, and, and there should be a language barrier there. They shouldn't be able to understand each other, and yet God removes this barrier of language for the sharing of his gospel. It, it is an incredible miracle. It's unbelievable. I I can't even wrap my mind around the physics of what happens there, right? Is God like changing the sound waves on the way to people? Like, I, I don't even know. I don't know what happened that allowed this incredible miracle to occur where God moves so that the spreading of the gospel can happen in a unique way on this day as, as his church is really kicked off in this moment. And it's powerful and exciting and incredible. And and the news of Jesus is powerful and exciting and incredible. And then check this out in verse 13. Check out how these guys respond. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. What? Like, we all know that obviously one of the things that happens to you when you get drunk is that you're able to speak in Chinese. Like that's, (laughs) right? Like what is happening here? How is that your solution that you came up with? You're like, we're all hearing them in our own native languages, in our own dialects, and, and, and obviously it was alcohol. Cool. Um, There will always be people who just want to be negative. (laughs) Don't allow that to cause you to miss what God's doing. Don't allow people who are choosing to just ignore the reality of how God is moving, how they want to justify it with things that don't even make logical sense. Don't allow that to cause you to miss what God's doing. Because then an absolute incredible miracle happens. And as they start to be questioned, Peter steps forward and is going to really represent them and, and speak for them here. And, and so he addresses them saying that it, this is alcohol and says basically this doesn't make, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense that this would be alcohol that's caused this. And then he starts to, to teach them about Jesus, and it it is this beautiful sermon. Please take time to read this this week. I'm limited on time, so we're gonna keep moving, but let me summarize it for you, okay? It is a a beautiful sermon where Peter weaves together some references from the Old Testament, from Jeremiah and and from the Psalms where David writes, and, and he brings incredible clarity. Hey, these guys were obviously talking about Jesus. Like, it's really, really clear that they were talking about Jesus right here. And so that's what we're here to share with you. We're here to share the gospel, the good news that that Jesus is here, that he has moved, that that lives are being changed, that eternities are being changed, that, that sin has been conquered because the Messiah has come. And he weaves this together and and wraps it up this way in verse 36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. And Peter's words pierced their hearts, and and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what, what should we do? 
Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away. That's us. (laughs) All who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. Man, the message of Jesus is powerful. It changes lives, it changes hearts, it it changes eternities. And so these these listeners are like, what what do we do? What what do we do? Like, we've heard you, we've we've heard the evidence, we we believe you, we believe that Jesus is this Messiah that we've been waiting for. We believe, what do we do now? Repent. Repent. Ask for forgiveness, repent, and turn back to God. This concept of repenting is such a beautiful concept. There is a version of just asking for forgiveness, right? Where we just, hey, can you take that one off the scorecard? Can you forgive me? And then I'll just keep moving on, right? More of saying sorry than really repenting. See, it's... I'll give you this example of repenting in in a non-sin fashion. Here's how I like to think about repenting, all right? When I am on a road trip, I will inevitably at some point make a wrong turn. And in that moment, when I make that wrong turn, my beautiful, wonderful, kind, loving, patient wife will very, very calmly, Matt, What are you doing? (laughs) And in that moment, I will repent. (laughs) Right? I'll say, oh, I'm so sorry. And then guess what? I don't do. I don't say, oh, babe, I'm so sorry, and then keep driving in the wrong direction. (laughs) Right? I say, oh, babe, I'm so sorry, and I turn around. Okay? And what Peter is talking about here is saying, hey, I'm sorry, I should turn around now. Saying, repent, seek forgiveness for your sins and turn back towards God and be baptized. And, and, and the reason we teach about baptism and and talk about baptism and practice baptism the way that we do here at Crosspoint is because it's what we see show up in Scripture over and over and over again, okay? This isn't one obscure reference where baptism is vaguely mentioned one time and then it never shows up in all of Scripture again. Baptism is repeated over and over and over for us. It is taught consistently, it is practiced consistently in the New Testament. And so we try to line up how we practice this with what we read in Scripture. That's one of the reasons that at Crosspoint, if you came to me after this service and you're like, hey, Matt, um, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, um, I want to repent of my sins and and I want to make him my Lord and Savior. Can I get baptized? My response to you in that scenario is going to be like, yeah, you want to go now? Like, let's go. Let's do it right now. And the reason that my response isn't like, we have an eight-week course for you to work through. And once you've worked through that, we can talk about it, is because that's not what we see happen in the Bible. In the Bible... Peter could have responded, repent of your sins, believe Jesus is who he says he is, and come back next week. 
for week two of my eight-week course on the differences between the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And that's kind of funny, but also, guys, there were significant differences between the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders that these people would have grown up learning from. There were big differences here. But he doesn't respond that way. He's like, look, if you're in, let's, let's celebrate your baptism. And it doesn't mean that they stop learning there. We, we read about them continuing to teach. It, it's important for us to continue to learn more about who Jesus is and about how we can follow him. But, but if we're ready to just say, you know what? I want to walk away from my sin. And I believe Jesus is who he says he is. I believe that he is the son of God. I believe that he died for my sins. And, and I want to make him my savior. If that's where we're at, then we'll celebrate your baptism today. We don't have to wait till next month or next year or, or put it on the schedule for six weeks out. Like, like we, don't, we don't need to do any of that. And so I, I wanna encourage you, whether you have been following Jesus, well, for 60 seconds or 60 years, if you have never been baptized, I wanna encourage you to be obedient to what we see in scripture. I wanna, be encur- I wanna encourage you to say, you know what? I'm not gonna wait any longer, I'm in. I wanna be obedient to what I see here. I wanna be obedient to what I read and, and, and there's not a reason to schedule that six months out. And so get baptized. Come find me after the service today. Come find any of our staff, any of our, our shepherds. Go out and, and talk to the guys um, by the, the, the prayer sign in the lobby or go to the Welcome Center. Just like start telling people, hey, I want to get baptized. Who do I talk to? Like just random people in the lobby, okay? Like we'll figure it out, all right? Because there's no reason to wait. There, there, this is, is so clear in Scripture. So if today you're sitting here and you're like, man, what do I do now? This is what you do now. And man, I love, I love baptism. I mean, we love baptism here at Crosspoint. It, it, it is a, a celebration for us in part because it's a continual reminder for us. It's a continual reminder that, that just like what happened 2,000 years ago when 3,000 people on one day got baptized, the work of Jesus is continued. The work of Jesus is still happening. And today, just like 2,000 years ago, Jesus is building his church. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you, Lord, that, that, you, that you are a God who welcomes us into your family. God, I thank you for this, this gift of baptism, God, for this new life that's offered to us, God, that, that Jesus has paid the price for our sins, Lord. Father, I, I could never praise you enough for that. Father, I, I pray this week that, that you will, will help us to remember that, that our lives, God, as followers of Jesus, our lives are a continuation of his work. God, that his story is not done, that his work is not done, that that we are to continue spreading the gospel, that we are to continue changing lives and hearts and eternities for him. Father, if there's anyone in this room who, who has not yet been baptized, I wanna encourage them today, God. I wanna pray that you'll work in their hearts. Father God, please, Lord, please. Give them the courage to not wait anymore. Give them the encouragement to make today the day, Lord. Father, we praise you for the gift that is your spirit. Father, we, we desire to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen.